I'd like to thank our speaker for joining us. Um, he is Hamed Zamani, uh, recently got his PhD from uh, UMass Amherst and joined the faculty as an assistant professor in the Center for Intelligent Information Retrieval. Um, he works on machine learning and neural methods for information retrieval and in particular interactive information retrieval such as conversational search. And um, we're really happy to have him speak today. And his title is Towards Mixed Initiative Conversational Search. So thank you, Hamid. Go ahead. Hi, thanks, Laurie, for the nice introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Mixed Initiative Conversational Search in the stock. And this is uh, kind of a summary of all the works that I've done in the past two years with uh, uh, a lot of amazing uh, colleagues at UMass, at Microsoft, University of Amsterdam, and uh, other places. Um, so before I start about talking about this jumping into mixed initiative interactions, I'd like to start with uh, the conversational search uh, in general. What does it mean and why it is important? Um, so nowadays, uh, we have seen like recent advances, like um, amazing improvements in semantic speech recognition systems. Um, and we have the, a lot of APIs, web APIs, or even in-device um, speech recognition systems that uh, provide a, a tool for uh, interacting using speech. Um, interactions. And the second reason is that the, the devices with limited bandwidth interfaces are getting more and more popular. Um, it started with uh, mobile devices and smartphones and nowadays uh, devices with uh, speech only interfaces such as Amazon Alexa and Google Home. Um, and the third reason is uh, the uh, recent advances in neural models, uh, the models that we can use for generative tasks, natural language generation or natural language understanding. So uh, we have a better capability of understanding um, and learning from language and generating them. And th these three reasons are kind of uh, motivating us to focus on conversational systems. But why conversational search? And that's kind of uh, obvious. That's because search is a really important service. We have trillion dollars companies built on top of only search and uh, it's been part of kind of every single intelligence systems that we observe. Um, but what is it? What's the def actual definition of conversational search? Is it uh, big, uh, just a combination of a voice interface with a search engine. Um, I would argue that it's not. Uh, it's not voice search. Conversational search uh, mainly deals with a lot of multi-turn interactions. So last year there was a seminar in Dachstuhl in Germany uh, on conversational search and we had a lot of discussions on how to define this and what is actually conversational search. And uh, this is uh, what we kind of came up with at the end of the seminar, that a conversational search system is a stateful, interactive information retrieval system with mostly natural language interactions. So these are some terms that I highlighted here that I want to um, emphasize on that a conversational search system, at the core of it, it is an information retrieval system. It deals with information seeking requests. So when we talk about conversational search, we don't talk about chit chat. We don't talk about like uh, the dialogues, uh, like dialogue systems with the goal of chit chat, or we don't talk about task oriented dialogues. Uh, we are dealing with information retrieval systems and information seeking requests. Uh, an important part of it, it is stateful and interactive. It should uh, consider the state of the interaction. It should keep track of it. It uh, can make connections with the current interactions and the previous interactions of the user with the system. And the interactions are mostly in natural language. And I say mostly because yes, in speech only uh, interfaces, 
maybe it's always initial language interactions, but when it comes to uh, multimodal interactions, when we have a screen and also um, voice interactions, there are some other interactions such as clicking, touching, and um, these sort of things that, that's why it makes it a mostly natural language interactions. Um, but conversational search, the term of conversational search probably is, has been coined in 2012 by Bruce Croft in this drill workshop, uh, but it has roots in early IR research in 1950s and 1960s. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. I wanted to uh, make a connections of what our um, leaders in the field uh, have done in the past and connected with the current research and the important topics we currently have. Um, Robert Taylor in 1968 uh, wrote a paper about how users uh, interact with librarians in uh, the early days. So, uh, before having computers in libraries, uh, the information seeker or the person who needs to find a book in the library, they usually goes and talks to the librarian. The librarians uh, have some little boxes with cards and they find the information they want. So Robert uh, Taylor started the interactions, the conversation between the seeker and the librarian, uh, which often is called intermediary. Um, and uh, he identified uh, five general types of information that is necessary to get to the desired state in a conversation, in an information seeking conversation. One is determination of subject. What is the subject that the user is interested in? What is the objective and motivation of the user uh, by having that uh, inquiry? The third one is the personal characteristics and characteristics of the seeker. And it's really interesting that in 1968, they were talking about personalization and these sort of things that it is important to uh, uh, understand what is uh, the personal characteristics of the user. So after, after this study, uh, there was another, uh, and about 10 years later, and this one was about studying the interaction between the user and the librarian, but the difference was that there is actually an online IR system there. So the, in, the librarian has a search system that can um, like search for the information need of the user, search for the books and magazines in, in the library. Uh, there was a conversation going on between the user and the librarian. And uh, what they find is that the nature of interaction between the user and the intermediary has a key, is a key factor in search satisfaction. Which is important. So the way that we interact, we as uh, humans or as systems, we interact with the users uh, in natural language. It has uh, like a major impact on search satisfaction. Um, later on, Birx and Belkin um, focused on the uh, different all of the interactions between the users and the intermediary person, as you can see in the right hand side of the slides, there is I as intermediary person and you as the user. And uh, they, they logged all of these interactions and then they defined a set of codes, a set of annotation codes uh, to go through these interactions and see uh, what they can learn from these conversations between the user and the uh, intermediary person. But the things that I was just talking about, those are related to kind of user studies, understanding how humans interact with each other about information seeking tasks. But what about systems, the search systems or conversational search systems? The uh, first one is probably this Thomas system uh, by Audi in 1977, which has uh, a kind of a rule-based dialogue systems um, for information retrieval tasks. And you can see that the user here um, can, let me use my pen. Okay, so the user can have a query, somebody query, and the system can retrieve a uh, kind of a document or a reference uh, to magazines or book or an article. And uh, the next step, the user can uh, say that, okay, yes, this, this was the right 
for example, magazine, but I'm not for looking for the um, number 11, I'm looking for the 12, or no, it wasn't like that, give us more information, or change the query from, uh, and write another query from scratch, or give a positive feedback. So is, is there some predefined rules to have an interactions um, in a dialogue system? And another one is uh, the iCube R system from Croft and Thompson 1986, that the users can have different types of information uh, needs from text descriptions to uh, a document. They want, want to retrieve documents similar to this or a Boolean query, and then they can write their information need and, uh, and provide a textual description. The next uh, step system provides a list of uh, documents in response to this textual query and the user can have interactions uh, providing positive feedback and so on. So it's kind of a, um, a interactive information retrieval system. And if you look at the architecture of the system, one of the things that uh, kind of we can notice is this component, characterize user. Um, and this is interesting because iCubeR was the first system ever that provide model, try to model users for um, kind of information retrieval tasks and um, emphasis on the, on the fact that we need to understand users and provide uh, kind of personalized results to the users for our tasks. Um, but most recently, uh, the conversational search has attracted much attention in a lot of different contexts. We have a track conversational assistant track, um, which focuses on passage retrieval and multi-turn interactions for multi-turn uh, kind of a series of uh, um, related queries. We have COCA and Quack, which are like conversational question answering benchmarks for um, answering questions from a uh, kind of a given passage and finding um, answers to a kind of a series of questions and um, others uh, coming from a knowledge graph and so on. Um, and this is an example from one of the conversational question answering benchmarks that, for example, for a given section in Wikipedia or a document, uh, there is a question and there is an answer extracted uh, from that particular section and there is a series of questions. But what is missing in uh, all of these uh, data sets, benchmarks, and studies that uh, we observe here uh, is that they all are based on a uh, kind of user ask system respond paradigm. So you user always ask a question, system com come up with an answer true or false, uh, doesn't matter, but they come, always come up with an answer to the question. Um, however, this is not the only type of interaction that we are looking for. In a conversational system, the systems can do a lot more. They can ask a clarifying questions. They can provide feedback to the user. They can educate users. Uh, so it is really important to study mixed initiative interactions in the context of uh, conversational search. And there's, there's a really nice paper from 1999 that focused on the mixed initiative interactions in human, human uh, conversations um, that study different levels of mixed initiative uh, interactions. And there, uh, they identified four levels of mixed initiative interactions. Um, and I want to especially focus on this level of uh, interaction, which is mostly about clarification and sub, sub dialogue initiation. And as you can see, uh, this level of mixed initiative interactions uh, is responsible for about 27% of all the interactions we have in, in the study in the human human interactions about the planning task, which is a significant percentage of interactions in the conversation. Um, and when it comes to the conversational search system, clarification can be um, kind of 
related to different components of the system. For example, clarification can be related to ASR when the speech recognition system fail or there is an ambiguity. Uh, the system can generate a clarifying question to clarify what, what the user said. Or uh, uh, they can, when they cannot find the right information from the uh, collection, they can uh, correct the user. Or the last one is uh, clarifying the intent of the user by asking that question, which is actually the focus of um, this part of this presentation that it is about search clarification. When we have a information seeking request, how we can clarify what the user actually meant. And search clarification can uh, be in conversational search, but also it can happen in a uh, like the traditional web search interface, the 10 blue links that we have in Google and Bing. Um, here are some examples uh, that we had in Bing. Um, so when uh, you search for query blue screen, you can ask the question of what version of Windows are you looking for? And they pr provide a number of clickable candidate answers. Um, when you ask for a 20th anniversary gift, can ask who are you shopping for. Um, and you ask NSFL, which is an ambiguous query, you can ask which NSFL do you mean? And because NSFL can uh, refer to multiple phrases um, and can be uh, kind of an abbreviation for multiple phrases. Or uh, the last example is bidding dresses that uh, it can ask, do you have any theme in mind? And provide a bunch of options like summer, modern, fall, beach, etc. So the question that I want to answer here is how we can generate these clarifying questions. Given a query, for example, as well, there is a query, web search query act 17, column 16, how we can generate clarifying questions. It would be really difficult for most of us to generate the clarifying questions for this because many of us don't know what does that mean or what are the different aspects of this query. But if I tell you that this is an act in Bible and this is different in different translations of Bible, then that's the, the aha moment that you can say, oh, yes, you can ask a clarifying question, but what translations of Bible are you looking for? So what I wanted to highlight here is if you want to generate a clarifying question, you need to identify different aspects of the query first. You need to identify that this for this particular query, the different aspects of it is different translations of Bible. Then when you identify that, then it becomes very easier to generate the, clarify, the clarifying question. Um, but how to identify these different aspects of a query? One way of doing that is focusing on query reformulation data. If we look at session data, um, the historical session data in this search engines log, we can observe that, for example, for the query shoes, uh, there are a lot of other queries that contain shoes and they come right after shoes in the same session. So the assumption here is that when the user search for a query and then they add another term to the query in the same session, it means that they are kind of providing more information. They are clarifying what they meant by the original query. Based on this assumption, you can uh, kind of mine all of these uh, reformulation data and see, okay, there are, for example, the ones in the red, they are about different types of shoes, the one in the black are about different brands of shoes, the blue are um, the persons who are going to use the shoes and so on. And then based on these aspects, you can generate the clarifying questions. For example, what brand are you looking for? So we went uh, through uh, the largest scale logs from Bing that we collected and um, we had a goal of understanding what are the different uh, uh, types of clarification that we can 
uh, observe in a uh, search setting. And we came up with this taxonomy uh, that we have four different types of classification. The first one is disambiguation. When a query is ambiguous and you want to disambiguate what the user wants. The second one is about a preference. Sometimes the query is not ambiguous, but based on the preference of the user, you can modify the result list. For example, the shoes that I just showed, it's not an ambiguous query, but uh, it's uh, kind of, uh, you can see that, okay, you can ask about personal information and uh, see what is uh, kind of the preference of the user. Or for some queries, you can ask about locational information or temporal information or the purpose. For example, if you search in Amazon, you search for a screwdriver. Um, and there are a lot of different screwdrivers that you can find from different sizes, different types. And you can say, okay, what is the purpose of this? What do you want to do with this screwdriver? Then uh, uh, after user response, we can find the one that is actually what would be useful for the user. The third one is about the topic. Um, and the topic can be subtopic information, or it can be about the recent events and news that's happening right now. For example, if you search for debate, these days it's most likely related to the um, US presidential debate. Um, so it can, there can be a clarification about these sort of things. And the last one is about comparison. When you wanna compare two items, or for example, especially in the case of product search, you wanna compare two products that you know, I wanna say, Xbox compared to the PS4 to see what, which one um, is the better fit for me. So after identifying the aspects of the query, then uh, it's time for generating a clarifying question. And a very simple way is to identify some templates and fill out the templates. Uh, using a, I don't know, a rule-based algorithm or a machine learning algorithm, which kind of worked pretty well because a lot of the uh, a lot of types that I mentioned in this slide can be clarified using a set of a handful of predefined question templates. Uh, but when uh, when we have a rule-based system or a template-based system, it's oftentimes it is difficult to generalize to a lot of queries, especially in an open domain setting such as web search. Um, this is another alternative of learning a model that can generate a, a clarifying questions. Um, what the model does is actually similar to a sequence to sequence um, model. Uh, it encodes every individual aspect of the query. Each aspect, the Q is a query, Q primes are the aspects that we mine from query logs, and the ET here is the entity type. And uh, entity type um, has been found very useful in uh, improving the generalizability of the model. So um, we can encode every single aspect of the query and then have an aggregation component to learn the whole uh, query aspects. Um, decide which aspect we want to focus on and then having a decoder to generate uh, the question. And these encoders and decoders can be, uh, you can use any favorite uh, neural architecture you like. You can use LSDNs, RNNs, or uh, transformers. But the question is how to train this model. You can train this model using a maximum likelihood optimization, uh, maximizing the likelihood of the clarifying questions you observe in the training data. But uh, we found that this is not uh, actually really optimal because uh, the model ends up generating the most common question in the data set uh, because of the objective. And the question that maximizes the likelihood of generating that text doesn't mean that this question maximizes the clarification probability. This is the best question for clarifying the information need of the query. So we wanted to maximize the clarification probability. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't come up with a nice uh, differentiable um, model objective for maximizing clarification. Um, and uh, we end up having a reinforcement learning model. 
and reach the uh, clarification probability, the non-differentiable clarification probability is used as the reward function uh, to um, like optimize the parameters in the question generation model. So the whole architecture is like that. The query comes, we have a query aspect generation, which is mining from query logs. We generate the question using the architecture I just described. We uh, generate a bunch of candidate answers. And then we have a clarification utility that computes a reward function for us. And we optimize this component based on, to maximize this probability. This clarification utility is uh, the probability of clarification is equal to one, as you know, the clarification is a um, binary hidden variable. And one means that uh, we want to, it clarifies the information need of the user. So the probability of clarification is equal to one, given the query, the clarifying questions, and the set of candidate answers that we generate. I'm not going to through uh, the math. If you're interested, please uh, look at this. Uh, paper published in the web conference. This component of the candidate answer generation is basically trying to maximize this probability. So the, uh, we want to find the candidate answer set that maximizes probability. But this one is an NP-hard problem. However, the, if you go through the math uh, of computing this probability, it's a monotone and submodular function. Uh, so it's good news because you can use this theorem uh, and use a greedy, simple greedy algorithm to generate candidate answers one by one. So this greedy algorithm basically says that if you generate candidate answers one after each other, generate the first one, then generate the second one, then uh, there is, you have uh, the optimal answers with this bounds. Um, And for a training, it's based on a reinforcement, the reinforced algorithm, uh, which is basically a cross entropy, the kind of likelihood of generating that probability, but followed by the reward of the current generation model and the previous one. And, uh, but we pre train the question generation model in order to avoid um, a lot of, uh, kind of exploration, early exploration in the model. And these are some examples of uh, the clarifications being gen generated by the model. For example, for the query retree, it asks, what do you want to know about this medication? And the options are dosage, coupon, side effects, cost information. Or um, for a query, Alan Turing, it's asked, what do you want to know about this British mathematician? Movie, suicide notes, codes, biography. Now that we know how, how we can generate clarifying questions, let's see how users interact with these clarifying questions. We had uh, a set of interviews and user studies uh, with users who use our system and being uh, this work is done, is done when I was at Microsoft. Um, and these phrases are from the interviews we, uh, we had, like they found it a convenient and easy, uh, that saves time in steps. Uh, it sometimes cues the user to things they may not have considered and help them find more relevant results. In another set of interviews, we asked them what, what, what's their opinion about non-relevant and low quality clarifications. So if they generate, uh, present a low quality clarification to the users, what they think about it. And, uh, this is the phrase from one of the interviews that says, it's like when I look at iPhones and eBay says, since you're looking at iPhones, you may be interested in, the, in these hair curlers. And I am like, well, that's weird, but whatever. So um, this says that, and we, we observe uh, the same response from a lot of different users. And it says that it's not uh, really bothering much about the quality of clarifications. And the main reason is that because in that case, the interface was web search. So we have this clarifying question on top of the SERP and 
the users can simply ignore if it's the quality of clarification is bad, they simply can ignore it and skip and go through the result list directly. But one interesting thing is that they find that the quality of the search result page after clicking or interacting with clarifying question was important. So they got frustrated if they interact with clarifying question and they don't find the information they want. Um, this is kind of a summary of the key findings from all the user interviews that we have uh, with the bank users, uh, that they find both emotional and functional benefits from this feature. The functional benefit of this is um, kind of obvious. It's sure that these questions help guide users in the right direction, which is actually our original goal. It was interesting to see that they also observed some emotional benefits. It, they said it brings to users a sense of confidence um, that the search engine understands what the user wants. So they kind of think that they have a sense of security uh, when they deal with search engine, they know, they think that they explored all the areas, especially when it comes to product search queries, when they want to decide what product to buy. When you ask the clarifying questions and they know that, okay, this is uh, kind of, uh, I know I have these clarifying questions help me to understand all aspects of this item. After these uh, user studies, uh, we ran an A-B test in a bank and wanted to see, okay, if uh, what is the goal or the role of this clarifying question? Because I can simply show these options, these candidate answers to the user without asking this clarifying question. What is the role of this? So we did an A-B test. And the A-B test was that for some reasons we showed this, and for some reasons we showed the same options with the same interface. The only difference was that we had uh, a generic text here instead of this clarifying question. And we observed 48% higher user engagements when we have a clarifying question. So when they observe such question here, they're more likely to interact with this clarifying questions. Uh, we did some analysis of the question templates and what is the engagement rate when for different uh, question templates that we have. These are the common question templates and T1 is the most common uh, the data set and T7 is the least common one. And we observed that the, for the most common clarifications we have relatively low engagement rate. So this should suggest that we need to generate specific clarifications as opposed to generic ones such as what would you like to know about query, about this query or something like that. Um, so more specific and um, less common clarifying questions lead to higher engagement rate. We also observed that the users who submit longer queries are more likely to interact with this clarifying questions. So the engagement with the engagement rate of interaction with clarifying questions is way higher when the queries are longer. And that was uh, kind of interesting. And we wanted to know what is the reason. So what, one hypothesis is that longer queries are uh, more tailish queries, more kind of less frequent queries. And um, the common belief is that the, the tailish queries have, the search engine has the lower performance, poorer performance for tail queries. So we think maybe that's the reason for head queries, which are short, uh, they directly go to the result list for tail queries. Interact. But when we uh, identify there is the engagement rate for tail queries and head queries, we didn't observe uh, any meaningful difference between the engagement rates. Uh, so another hypothesis about the type of queries that they ask. So these are the natural language questions and these are the other queries such as keyboard queries and search. And we observe a 
huge difference between these two engagement traits. Uh, we don't really know the underlying reasons of this, but one uh, kind of hypothesis is that the users who would like to write natural language questions as queries, they are kind of more likely, they would like to have these sort of interactions with this system. So it's kind of a personality uh, based about the users. And we also find that the faceted queries require more clarification. So users with faceted queries are more likely to interact with clarification than ambiguous queries. We also observed that 7% of users, when they interact with this clarifying question, 7% of them keep clicking on multiple options. So they're kind of exploring different intents of the query. And uh, that's an indication of the usefulness of clarification for exploratory search tasks. So what I was talking about here was uh, mostly about clarification in, in the context of web search. But when we have a conversational system, for example, speech-only conversational systems, the responses can be in any form. They don't have to select click on any predefined form. They can say anything they want. So what we can do here, the major challenge here is evaluating uh, conversational search systems uh, because it's difficult to create reusable test collections um, for these um, sort of tasks. Um, what we did was, this is an example of two, the two users that submit the same query, but they have different information needs. One of them um, is interested in discovery channels, uh, the di dinosaur sites of discovery channel, and the other one is interested in different kinds of dinosaurs with pictures. And you can see that the system can start having question, clarifying question, the user response, and at the end they can clarify what the user wants. So to build a um, kind of reusable test collection, we looked at the track diversification track. So in the, in 20, from 29 to 2012, uh, Trek had a web track, which has diversification tasks. And what the goal of the diversification was that if a query has three different subtopic or facets, uh, we want to have a result of this that cover all of these subtopics. So we have relevance judgments for each subtopic. We know that this document is relevant to this facet, this document is relevant to this facet. So the goal of diversification was to uh, having a result is of mix of all of these different uh, subtopics. While the goal of our um, task in clarification is the other way around. We want to clarify the information needs such that we can find all of the doc relevant documents that are related to this particular uh, facets of the query and the other ones related to this facet. So we take advantage of all the relevance judgments we have from the track web track. And uh, in the like, um, diagram of uh, asking clarifying questions, instead of generating, having a model that generates clarifying question, we assume that there is a question bank and we need to only select one of those questions. And this is, the reason is that we wanted to have a reusable test collection. We wanted to iteratively evaluate models. So if we have a question bank, we can have the responses to all of these questions uh, uh, from collected from crowdsourcing, and then we can have a collection that can be used for uh, uh, asking for our point question. So we ran in a user study, um, sorry, a crowdsourcing, uh, and we collected a lot of clarifying questions and responses, user res responses to these clarifying questions. And uh, here's some statistics that we collected 10,000 question answer pairs for about uh, 200 topics and uh, 760 different facets.
Most recently, we had a, um, another data set that we released based on uh, the web search. We had, uh, for example, this query, we have a clarifying question, also candidate answer set. So we release this information. In addition, we also release the impression level, which is what is the frequency of this query submitted by the users, so how tailish or headish this query is. And the engagement level, how often the users interact with this uh, kind of clarification pane and conditional click-through rates, that if, if a user interacts with this clarification, what is the probability of clicking on each individual option? And this data set is um, kind of a larger scale. We had over 400,000 unique queries um, with click data. We have um, over 64 unique queries then we have random explorations. For example, we did random exploration experiments to see what will happen if we change the question, if we reorder the options and so on. And about 2,400 uh, unique queries with manual annotations of the quality of uh, the clarification and candidate answers. So if we wanna uh, compare these two data set, this one is um, kind of, small scale, this one is very large scale. Both are dealing with open domain search tasks. They're kind of, the document types are web pages. The tasks are web search. And uh, the clarifying question here is the human generated through crowdsourcing. Here are generated using a machine learning model that I uh, presented earlier. The user responses here again is natural language written by users or crowd workers and mimics its uh, user interaction signals, such as clicks and click-through rates uh, from real users. So if we have an example, the user says, tell me about migraine, uh, the search, uh, the conversational search system can say, are you looking for migraine symptoms? And the user can say no. So what's the one thing that I want to highlight here is that what the system can do here. So how we can utilize this information or these user responses. Uh, now the system knows that the user is not interested in migraine symptoms, but what else is there? What else this user might be interested uh, in? It could be by looking at number of documents that contain migraines, it could be about symptoms, treatments, medicine, and so on. So it would be uh, useful if we can learn representations based on this kind of a uh, documents that contain these migraine information, kind of as an external source. Uh, so uh, we do have uh, a transformer model, if we have a transformer model for rep learning representations. We can extend it to a, a so-called guided transformer in which these external sources can, be gu can guide the representation we have for the input. So this input is the conversation that the user had with the system, and these sources are those uh, documents that contain the query. So it can say, okay, if there is other signals, provide feedback to the user and learn with the representations. Um, here are some results that um, shows uh, we can get about like 20 percent improvements, relative improvements, compared to uh, many baselines uh, for next clarification selection. And so th this part of the talk was about, so I think I've done with most parts of the talk, but um, in this part of the talk, I wanted to talk about uh, the connections between search and recommender systems. Because in conversational search, uh, the boundaries between search and recommendations becomes really blur. Um, and we can have a joint modeling of search and recommendation. We can learn representations, joint representations for items and users that are shared between a search engine and recommender systems. Um, for example, if this is a typical neural collaborative filtering, that we take the representations of the user and the item and multiply the representations and predict whether this user would like this item or not. 
we can multiply this representation to a pre-trained relevance-based word embedding uh, and their representations, the V-dimensional representations. And by doing a softmax, you can get a unigram language model for this particular item. So therefore, these representations, if you have an item reconstruction objective here for textual description, these representations won't be just some unknown hidden variables anymore. They can be, we have two objectives, one to predict the like um, interactions of user with the item and another one to predict the, the textual description of the item. So it tries to have learn, learn kind of uh, interpretable representations that can be used for search as well. Uh, for example, these are the representations learned by uh, a movie recommendation uh, model, the movie lens data set. As you can see, the, these are the terms with the highest probability. As you can see, for example, for the Lord of the Rings, you can see Potter here, the high probability. And the reason is that there is no relation between, between Potter and the Lord of the Rings, but the users who like the Lord of the Rings, they also like Harry Potter. And that's why this collaborative filtering information can intervene here and uh, gives us um, like the representations that could be good for recommendations. So you can kind of use this information for different tasks for improving the performance of both systems because we, has, we are using the data from both sides. Uh, we can use this for interpretable, ex explainable recommendation. And uh, we can learn user profiles, textual user profiles, similar to the item representations we learned. We, have, we can bridge the modalities and domain using this universal textual descriptions and you can have a conversational search and recommendation model. And the last thing I want to talk about is an open source um, toolkit uh, that uh, you can use for uh, training and evaluating and uh, building systems for conversational tasks, conversational information seeking tasks. It's available on github.com slash Microsoft slash Macau. Um, what it does, it has a modular architecture that the user can interact with the interface. It retrieves all the previous interaction of the user and create a list of uh, messages as a conversation and dispatch this messages to set up actions. Um, and um, this is the interface of this that we have. You can build your own interface, but what's currently in the system can have a mobile interface or web app interface for multiple different OSS. And uh, this can have multi uh, multimodal interactions. You can have multiple options that users can click on or touch the screen. It does have speech recognition and speech generation. And um, it retrieves documents, generates answers from the documents, so on. Um, so if you are interested in, for example, say you are interested in the question answering part of it, you can grab this model and only touch the components, the module that is dealing with question answering and use the rest of the architecture for retrieval and uh, processing and conversational uh, retrieval. And I don't know, for example, this is the action about search recommendation for core reference resolution and query generation. Uh, we have a retrieval model we can use. Um, this open source search engines such as Indri and Galago, or you can use um, web search APIs such as Bing API and get the results. Um, another action could be executing a comment, like comment, the predefined comments that you can execute. There are other actions you can think of, clarification recommendations are the ones that we talk about, so you can have these sort of mixed initiative interactions there. Uh, if you're studying user um, interactions or you want to collect a data set, it also supports visit of all studying. So you can have another person sitting on the other side of it and they interact, the user interact with this and this intermediary person or the um, wizard person can interact with the system, get the information and write the response to the user. And Macau logs all the interactions for you. 
so that's pretty much it. Uh, there are a lot of open problems and future directions in this area. Evaluating misinitiative conversational search is uh, one of them. Uh, I talked about clarifications, I talked about search and recommendation together, but there are a lot of different levels of mixed initiative interactions and then they come all together, evaluation becomes a really big challenge. Search result this explanation is a really interesting topic. Um, the, in limited bandwidth interfaces, they don't have um, the ability to show the full list of results list to the users. So we need to come up with an explanation for the full result list of their page, uh, sorry, the result page, search result page. Um, integrating chit chat and dialogue systems, task oriented dialogues into conversational search and recommendations. So we have a kind of a unified system that can handle all of these interactions. It's interesting. Um, generating clarifying questions without access to query logs because um, everything I talked about was heavily based on query reformulation data, larger scale data. So what will happen to the tail queries when we don't have enough query formulations to generate the, the aspects of the query. Preference elicitation uh, of the user about recommendation is uh, tightly coupled with clarification in search. And um, it's interesting to be studied. And um, having this joint search and recommendation model, but in a conversational setting is another interesting topic that um, this is open for future work. These are a list of papers that I used um, in this presentation. I would like to thank all of my amazing colleagues here. And thanks for listening. And um, again, thanks for inviting me. I'd be happy to take any questions.